All right, welcome back, guys. Uh, right now we have with us author John Stiff. Uh, you've been nominated for like Hugo's and all sorts of great stuff. Uh, you write uh, science fiction. Uh, since our interviews are kind of short times, what I would love to hear from you today is tell us about your most recent project. Like what excites you about it and kind of the impetus behind creating it. Okay, uh, the most recent project is a graphic novel I'm just starting. Uh, that's based on a, a story I've, I've finished. It's called Tiny Time Machine. And in it, a couple, uh, the world basically is going to die of starvation unless a couple of loners on the run for cops can use a bizarre time machine to, to make things right. What What is it that, that drives you to, like, write science fiction like it's you know you have to create like this whole new world these whole concepts like what is it that excites you about writing sci-fi uh, i love technology i love thinking about the future uh, i love the just the pure adventure of, of some good science fiction when uh when you're when you're approaching like a new project a new novel like what is what's your process like when you you know when you're saying how what world am i going to put this in like what kind of future you know when you're you know, you write something dystopian, you have to create why it's dystopian. You know, when you when you're writing something like hard technological space opera, like what is it that what's your process like when you're developing like your worlds? Uh, I usually start with three things. I start with some emotional issue that that's concerning me at the time. Uh, one of my books, the issue of the time was taking personal responsibility for what you do. <laughs> it's it's uh, not a big theme, but. But it was important to me at the time, and it was some something I could connect to emotionally. And I start with uh, also some aspect of science that I, or science fiction, you know, right. that, I, that I want to use. And I have an L, uh, I choose a background that will that will work for that story. And so once I have those three elements in place, then then that combination of things kind of starts suggesting new things to me. So. so I, I've written, uh, I wrote one novel one time. It was a, an incredibly difficult process. It uh, is. Um, you know, the, you, you, you read about writers who, as they're writing, the characters begin to, like, effectively live on their own. Like, they start to kind of write themselves. And I experienced that while writing a novel that, you know, you've developed, like, the basic of the character. And as you continue, you're like, this is what they would do next. Like, what... You know, what's the feeling like when you when you hit the groove as you're writing? Like, is it when you start out, is it like, oh, kind of pulling teeth and then you move into it? I, I hate beginning. It's it's the, the toughest aspect of writing for me. But when I have a, a clear view of where I want to go and say the next 10 or 20 pages, that's perfect. That's wonderful. <laughs> it's it's that moment of relief where you're like, oh, I get where it's going finally. <laughs> you right, know, right. Um, I, I do want to know where I'm going ahead of time. I, I do plot out uh, ahead of time. But there are always surprises along the way, and there are changes along the way. So. What do you think, it, as as a writer, what's the, in your work, what was the biggest surprise? You, when you came to a junction in, in your writing and you're like, oh, I didn't expect to write about this. Uh, the only thing I can think of that comes closest to that is... Uh, I had been accumulating ideas in my file for science goes wrong, basically. But I'm inherently a strong believer in science and in the scientific method. But, you know, we have everything from robocallers that screw up. But, uh, I mean, technology has a deleterious effect on our life in a lot of ways, okay. as well as the good stuff. Uh, so I, I wasn't sure I wanted to really write a novel about science doesn't work. Uh, and then I finally found a hook to put that on. And, and the story Not For Hire in Analog is based on uh, a near future world where the educational system has been damaged severely. Uh, like, you know, <laughs> like now. <laughs> like now. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's more like we're teaching religion in classroom, in the classroom right. rather than science. And we also have the, the, for, the market force of it has to be cheap, it has to be right now. And so we're releasing many products that are beta products. Subpar, yeah. And, and so when you put all those together, you have a near future where 
uh, AIs are heavily used, but they're poorly implemented. They're badly designed, and so they have human-like psychoses and character faults. And so you have technology giving humanity a terrible time in, in comic ways. So, so um, Google created uh, artificial intelligence to barter, okay? And it taught itself how to, you know, do things like put value on something that it doesn't want to get a better deal on the thing that it does want. And as it was creating like this algorithm to do that, it actually began creating its own language to communicate with other computers. When you hear something like that, is that exciting or terrifying for you? <laughs> uh, it's exciting. <laughs> I, I mean, frankly, the idea of true AI does give me pause. Uh, and, and people are talking about AI now and Siri and, and yeah. Alexa when that's nothing like actual AI. But uh, it's just very effective search engineering. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's all it is with a good text to, to speech or speech to text front end. Right. Uh, but it's it's a portent of things to come. Yeah. <laughs> in a very small way. Uh, it's, but but yeah, ideas like that really do excite me. From a writing point of view, I'm nervous about them because if I'm excited about a, a new idea that's hot off the press, I'm worried that you know, a hundred other writers are also excited by that. So I've tended to go farther into the future because uh, that makes you a little bit more immune to that. Right. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I love knowing what's on the near horizon. It, it would be amazing. It's, it's the, the, you know, HG Wells where he basically, you know, predicted the future. You know, the things that you're writing that are happening in the year 3030, you know, right. or whatever, they end up being real, you know, and right. it's that thing where, you know, when we're talking about the Terminator movie and, you know, it, AI goes live and it becomes this real thing. Right. And then we're watching as this computer is literally like making a new language because it's more effective at communicating if it does it its way. You right. know, it's like, oh, right. crud. I, for one, welcome our new robot overlords. Right. But <laughs> yeah. uh, when, you know, when you're dealing with technology and, uh, you know, looking at the, the pros and cons of it, you know, we, we look at our society right now like I'm trying to connect to the Internet on my phone because I'm desperate to get information about things that are going on today. And I can't because there's too many people on their phones. Right. You know, everybody's hooked up. When you see things like that, are you like, oh, I read about this, you know, in a Ray Bradbury book or uh, this is something I wrote about 15, 20 years ago. Like, right. When you see how society is. And like kind of the trajectory of your writing, does it make you think, oh, crap, this could get weird? <laughs> you know? uh, yeah, that's that's true. You know, I, I've certainly seen those echoes of fiction that are in reality now. I, uh, I think science fiction's job isn't necessarily predictive, but it's a great way to explore all the all the possibilities and, and kind of beta test some of the futures before we say like 1984. You know, that's a road we really don't want to go down. Doesn't keep us from going down that road. Yeah, but clearly. It, but, <laughs> but it helps. When uh, science fiction has a strong, uh, a, a strong desire to not just like address like technology in the future, but also like societal like issues and ideas. You know, is that something that you try to inject into your writing? Like, not just this is the scope of technology to come, but also like social messaging. Uh, I, I do. You know, it's hard to separate uh, te technology change from society's changing. I think human beings are still human beings down down deep. You know, we still uh, there are our bigots and greed exists, and and uh, we have a lot of negative characteristics. But I think as a society, we're getting better, and, and as individuals, we're getting better and better at uh, rising above uh, some things. You know. Ages ago, the, the us or them instinct was helpful. It helped preserve life. It may be an instinct that we no longer really need. Right. Uh, or we don't need in all the context that's employed. In. So, so we're, we're changing, but th that's one easier thing about writing is that people are really kind of the same people that we've, <laughs> right. we've had for quite a while. There's, there's always been this hope in me because I've, I've been a very big science fiction fan for a, a, a 
good chunk of my life. You know, one of the first movies I ever saw in the theater was, you know, Empire Strikes Back and all that sort of thing. But there's there's always been this desire uh, ever since I watched Independence Day, the movie Independence Day, that aliens would invade so that the whole world would have something to come together under. Right. You know, right. there's there's that moment where, you know, the Starfleet realizes that, you know, the Federation realizes that as humanity, we can explore the cosmos, but as individual nations, we can't do it. Right. Like there's that social social idea of we work better as a people than as peoples you right. know, is is always been something that makes me love science fiction. So it's 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 neat to hear an author that's like, yeah, we do that on purpose. <laughs> yeah, there's a good novel called The Stars Are Too High from, I think, the, the 50s or 60s in which some people deliberately created a, a UFO threat to unite the world. Uh, hmm. <laughs> no, I better Some not bigger, do that. I think, ter- enemy, I think yeah. I'd be called a terrorist if that happened. But right. yeah, <laughs> John, thank you so much for being on our show. Please tell our listeners how they can uh, find your books, access any information about you so that they can go read the fantastic books that you're writing. Okay, well, the central hub is my website, neverend.com. And I'm on Facebook, both as a person and a profession. And um, you're welcome to friend me in either sense. I have uh, pictures of raccoons in my backyard on my my, uh, personal page, as well as writing news. I'm easy to find. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Just for the record, it's John Stith. It's spelled like Sith with a T in front of the I. (laughs) Or or like Smith with a T. (laughs) I think our fans will probably relate to the Sith a little. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Baseline's changed. Thank you so much for being on our show. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. It was a pleasure. Thank you.